our, uh, our list is risk, risk factors for incisional hernia after a laparoscopic colon resection. Lawrence Lee. I'd like to thank the, um, the moderators and sages for letting me uh, present my work today. This is my disclosure slide. Incisional hernia is a common complication after midline laparotomy with an incidence that may reach up to 20%. It was hoped that the smaller incisions used for laparoscopic colon surgery would uh, decrease the incidence of an incisional hernia. However, a recent Cochrane meta-analysis uh, reported that the rate of incisional hernia after laparoscopic colectomy was in fact much higher than expected and did not differ between the open and laparoscopic approaches. One strategy to decrease the incidence of uh, incisional hernia is to differ the, spe the specimen extraction site. Currently, the most commonly used uh, incision for specimen extraction is a, is a small midline incision. However, as seen before, uh, it is associated with uh, a high incidence of incisional hernia. However, two recent papers uh, have uh, suggested that using an off midline incision instead of a midline incision for specimen extraction may dramatically decrease the incidence of incisional hernia. Therefore, we decided to test this hypothesis at our institution. The objectives of our study were to number one, determine the impact of specimen extracting site on the development of incisional hernia in laparoscopic colectomy, and as well, identify other risk factors for incisional hernia in laparoscopic colectomy. We performed a retrospective chart review. Of note, choice of incision was uh, at the surgeon's discretion. Incisional hernia was identified via post-operative imaging or follow-up clinic notes. Wound infection was defined as per, this, uh, as per the Center for Disease Control Guidelines on Surgical Site Infections. And as well, univariate and multivariate analysis um, were performed to identify risk factors for incisional hernia. From the operating room database, we identified all elective laparoscopic colorectal resections over a five-year period. We excluded patients who had a stoma creation, who had a fat and steel incision converted to open, as well as several, uh, several other criteria. We decided a priori to exclude patients with fat and steel incisions because we felt that this was a specimen extraction site that was specific for low rectal cancer procedures. We were then left with a patient population of 155, of which the majority underwent midline extraction. Looking at the procedure breakdown, we see that the majority of patients either went a right or a left uh, hemicolectomy. When comparing the midline and the transverse groups, there was no difference in age, gender, diabetes, malignancy, and wound infection, both superficial and deep. However, the transverse uh, group had a slightly higher body mass index of 29 compared to 26 for the midline group. When looking at the rate of incisional hernia, we see that uh, there, the rate in the midline group was 10% compared to only 5% in the transverse group. However, this, this difference was not statistically significant. And follow-up between the two groups uh, were similar as well. We then performed a univariate analysis to identify risk factors for incisional hernia. We found that a higher body mass index, uh, the presence of a wound infection, and longer follow-up were associated with um, incisional hernia, whereas age, gender, diabetes, and extraction site were not. We then inserted uh, the three significant variables, as well as uh, specimen extraction site, into a multivariate analysis to identify independent predictors for uh, incisional hernia. And again, we see here that body mass, a higher body mass index, the presence of a wound infection, and longer length of follow-up uh, remain significant in, after multivariate analysis, whereas specimen extraction site did not. Therefore, in summary, we, in our series of patients, we did not find a statistically significant difference in the rate of incisional hernia between midline and transverse extraction sites. We also found that wound infection and body habitus may be more important than specimen extraction. Limitations of our study, uh, obviously it's a retrospective review with a small sample size, and in particular, uh, there was a particular imbalance between the two groups. Nevertheless, we performed this study to provide pilot data for a uh, randomized clinical trial that is currently undergoing patient accrual um, at our institution. Thank you. We'll take some questions uh, before we do. Did I miss your disclosure slide, or do you have disclosures to uh, declare? Um, I thought.
thought there was. I one. apologize if I didn't see it. No, there there was one. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, ahead, Sharon Tofai from Los Angeles. Your data seems to conflict with the urology data after robotic prostatectomy, where they've shown that suprapubic or off midline extraction sites are superior to taking the specimen out of the umbilicus in terms of incisional hernias. So is there a difference in that population, do you think? Well, in the urologic data, they used, they did, um, demonstra they did use fan and steel incisions. Uh, and, uh, comp versus they compared fan and steels and midlines. And uh, in our patient population, we decided to exclude fan and steels completely. So we were looking at uh, mainly transverse incisions rather than fan and steels. And in the, one of the studies that was published uh, last year, uh, they did show that the fan and steel incisions had a 0% incisional hernia rate after I think about two years of follow-up compared to midline, which was about like 15%. So I can't really compare fan and steel to uh, transverse incisions, but your point is taken. Alicia Logue from University of Texas. Um, I've seen your data is pretty well correlates from what we're seeing as well. And this population, I think about two thirds of our population is at least obese. And um, whether we use transverse or vertical, they both tend to herniate. Are you guys putting mesh in prophylactically in the obese population? Uh, that's an interesting question. We do not, um, especially um, after uh, colonic transection, there is a risk, there is a higher risk of mesh infection and uh, you know, all the complications that are associated with that. So we, I don't know if that's been studied honestly, but that's an interesting question. If, but I don't know if the cost of using a biologic mesh or a um, absorbable mesh would outweigh the, uh, the uh, risks of it. Hi, uh, Alex Wade, general surgery in uh, rural Wisconsin. I do cesareans. Um, including emergent. Are you excluding fan and steel incisions from your randomized controlled trial? Uh, yes, we are. So you have a group of patients, you, you now have data that suggests that this is a superior incision and you're randomizing patients to inferior, in, to different inferior incisions? Well, we, like, like I said before, we decided to exclude fan and steels in particular because we felt that this was a um, specific incision used for low rectal cancers where you, if you needed to do a, uh, an open distal transection using a TA stapler, that would be uh, easier. Um, we mainly will randomize patients undergoing left or right uh, hemicolectomy. And as well, one of the exclusion criteria for our randomized study is a low anterior resection for which a fan and steel is planned uh, a priori. I would encourage you to teach and use the fan and steel incision. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that point. So um, a lot of the surgeons or the colorectal surgeons in our institution do their anastomosis extracorporeally, and that's why they would choose to do a midline or a transverse as opposed to a fan and seal. However, if they did convert, for example, or if they did decide to do an intracorporeal, then I think a, a fan and seal would be an excellent choice for specimen extraction. So I think that's sort of the patient population that's going to be randomized are those that are going to have extracorporeal anastomoses. <laughs> Thank you. And, and then I have one last question. Um, do you use a wound protector on, on how many of your cases? And then if you are, why would you then exclude the hand assist device? Because in some people's minds, it's just a fancy wound protector. That's an interesting question. We do use them routinely um, now. Uh, when, like I said, this was a retrospective review and the use of wound protectors was not always routinely reported. However, at least looking at um, our series starting, uh, our recent series starting 2009 and uh, onward, we used them for every single case. And for your hand assist, um, we thought that most of the hand assists were also done through a fan and steel in our institution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee.